Good morning and good afternoon. This is Tim Harris with the Harris Real Estate University, and this is the Harris Real Estate University Friday Superstar Interview. Now, what is the Friday Superstar Interview? And those of you who listen every Friday, bear with me as I give a description to those who have joined us for the first time today. Every Friday, Julie and I choose a leader, a true mover and shaker from the real estate industry or a related industry, someone that can be impactful on you, someone that has something to offer, something, someone that has something to say. We've had famous economists. We've certainly had top-producing uh, agents, lots of top-producing Harris Real Estate University students. And today is no exception. So today uh, we have secured the, not just the number one loan officer, certainly in California, but the number one loan officer in the nation for Bank of America, Mr. Kevin Buddy. So Kevin, welcome to the call. Thank you very much. So Kevin, let's not miss, mess around. Let's just jump right in. I know you know you and I talked a little bit prior to today's call, and and you certainly had a lot to offer. And I don't want to slow down the pace of the call at all. Tell them who you are, where you uh, where you offer your services, and how they can get a hold of you. Okay. Well, I'm with Bank of America Home Loans. I'm located in Laguna Niguel, California. I'm in a home loan center where we process, underwrite, and close all the loans. However, we do handle loans in all 50 states. Uh, we're not just limited to Southern California. And I've been in the mortgage banking business uh, here in Orange County since 1975. So January will be 36 years. Okay, fantastic. So it's not just you, obviously. You have a, a quite a large team that works with you. So if someone wanted to send you a loan, how would that work? Tell me about the process. Say a realtor in Ohio wants to do business with you after listening to today's interview. How would they go about doing that? Well, they're more than welcome to reach out to me directly. Uh, I always publicize my cell number. I'm always available. I'll usually talk to them, understand what the needs are. But I do have a team of, uh, I'd say, six uh, junior loan officers that work for me to help uh, handle and assist the business, as well as three uh, personal assistants that also address and help uh, along the way get to move the loans through. So that way we always have someone available and can do things in a very timely manner. Okay, very good. Um, so... You know, you're the number one loan officer in the nation for really what has to be the largest bank, if not the largest mortgage company in the world. What does it take to be performing at that level in an economy like this? Well, tremendous consistency. You know, my whole um, career I focused on working with real estate agents, not just being um, at during the uh, low interest rate cycles and applying for refinances, but being focused on the real estate community because that part continues on no matter what the economy is doing. Someone is always buying and selling a home. And so I've just stayed focused on it. And I try much like what your university and what you are attempting to do to bring value and education to people. That has always been my number one goal is not just go out and ask for the business, but to try and bring credibility, information, knowledge uh, to all the agents to help them with their business model. And then the rest falls in place and helps us. So um, what's changed in your business as a result of, obviously, I don't know what we want to call it, really. I'm just kind of tired of calling it the crash, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Well, as I said, this is my third housing downturn. That's pretty much what I call it because it is always very cyclical. Um, and so during this one, obviously six years ago, I don't think there was a single person out there that even knew what a short sale was or considered themselves an expert in that arena. And so there wasn't hardly any foreclosures at that time. So the advent of what's taken place with uh, that whole marketplace is what's really changed and is different than the previous ones that we've seen. How's that? Be, give us some more information on that. That sounds interesting. Well, what I mean by that is is that it's con considered more mainstay. Uh, I remember back my first downturn, which was 80, 81. Uh, it, was, it only lasted about two years. It was very severe. Interest rates were really high. And during that time period, there were foreclosures, and they happened uh, during that period of time, but never to this level and throughout the whole stage of the nation. So most of them were more severe, and, and certain areas were more affected. This seems to be across throughout the country. Yes, Arizona, Nevada, Florida, uh, and California have been hit harder than some states, but everyone seems to have been affected by this particular downturn. And finding that the longer it lasts, the more people become acclimated to the idea. Previous so, downturn. Oh, go right. ahead, sorry. 
He said, well, no, no, no. I mean, that's a really good point. The, but last bit with regards to the fact that it's gone from, you know, it's a real estate crash, let's just all sort of wait for it to be over, to sort of like we're moving into this new phase where it seems to be people are accepting the fact that, well, you know, this is the market, so let's just cut through the drama and just deal with, with the cards that we've been dealt. Have you noticed kind of a shift like that? Well, pretty much there's even been a whole change in the philosophy and thought process of the home buyer, right. where we've never used the term before, strategic defaults, things <laughs> where people actually uh, uh, thought of just letting it go. Um, you know, I, I remember back, you know, in the, what you're talking in the 50s and the 60s, things like a, a divorce or a bankruptcy were, were unthought of. No one would do that, and especially a foreclosure, where now it's, it's more commonplace. But when you bring it to the housing market and people are just realizing, you know what, they, it's just a, a strategic move they need to do financially, much like what large corporations do, uh, GM and everyone else, they just file bankruptcy and it's acceptable. Well, now it's become more of the individuals. And so we're seeing this change. It's actually going to carry forward in the mentality of agents, buyers, and everyone going forward, even after we do see a return to a more housing market. More yeah, stable. And, and that certainly signifies a pretty massive shift in people's mindsets with regards to contracts. So I, I'd imagine from a lender's perspective and you know, speaking on behalf of yourself or Bank of America, whatever you feel comfortable, I mean, you guys have to be taking a really different look at a potential borrower now than you did say in 2006 and 07 it has to be a more thorough process, shall we say? Well, a lot, of, yes, but the mindset was quickly changed through the federal government. They have really cramped down. In most cases, they've made uh, stated income or reduced documentation uh, an illegal process by the lenders. Now you have to prove and substantiate that you're doing all those things. And the pendulum has not only swung the other way, it's actually jammed up the other side currently. What does that mean? What do you mean by that? Meaning that, you know, because when I started in the business in in, in 75, there was only known as full doc. Most of the loans were FHA and VA, and they were government loans. And you always ask people for uh, some pay stubs, a W-2, and you, and you did it. But now every little thing is questioned, the breakdown of those W-2s, the breakdown of the bank statements, where did that deposit come from? more letters of explanation, more in-depth, thorough analysis of the buyer, which creates a delay to the process in many times and also creates an irritant to the, uh, home, the home buyer who's trying to get, the, get a loan. That must be a very challenging issue to deal with, especially folks that have bought and sold houses over the past, past 10 years and were used to basically being able to walk in and buy off their signature, and now they're having to go through really a, a thorough, almost investigation of their ability to pay. That must be something that's very difficult to deal with, folks' emotions and really egos about that level of uh, application. Well, uh, they're starting to now read about it and hear about it a little bit more common, but anyone who hasn't bought a home in the last six years, we make a point of making them aware what it is entail, setting expectations up front, and also going out to the agents and saying we need to speak with home buyers up front the day of putting them in a car, driving them around, selling them a home, and then saying now go talk to the lender are over or should be over. Uh, going through as much analysis up front, uh, helping the buyer understand the process, what's going to be expected, and going through part of that analysis up front called a pre-qualification or pre-approval as we like to do it is so much more important. But once you set expectations for clients up front, it does make the process that much better for them. Well, so let's talk about that because that's a really valid point. We have obviously mostly agents, top producing agents from around the country, and believe it or not, we have agents in different uh, in different countries that listen to this call. And uh, it's important, I think, that they understand that because the loan process is more complicated now, let's just use that word complicated, it is more lengthy, it does require more um, you know, paperwork and verifications and the rest of it, it's probably very important that that realtor puts that buyer with you really immediately. As soon as that relationship is established between the buyer and the realtor, then it's probably a very good idea just for the sake of securing the loan in time for them to close whenever they find their subject property that they that they really transfer that buyer to you. How do you prefer? What's the ideal situation? And how do you how does you you and your team really, I guess is the question, how do you guys work as part of a team with a realtor? 
Well, what happens is more common now as agents market through their websites and the Internet and picking up solicitation of leads, they like to tell the, the client the first thing you want to do is get with a lender, uh, get your, find out all the approvals, all the things you're going to need in order to uh, go through and exactly what you do qualify for, and they usually do uh, allude to the fact that things have changed. So at that point, they'll usually say, well, who should I talk to? Or, and they'll try and get, work with someone that they, they know and trust and know and gets the job done. Then at that point, the contact's made between the, uh, our, like our team and the buyer, and then we go through that process with them. Uh, pre previous years, it was easy enough just to pretty much talk to someone on the phone and, and, and ask them what their credit scores were and, and issue some form of letter, but those, those aren't worth the paper they're written on anymore. Uh, typically, what we do is we will tell the buyer it's a process where there's no cost, no obligation, and it's about a 24 to 48 hour process. But we usually have them send us their uh, whatever necessary documentation, be it minimum is usually W 2s and pay stubs, and often includes tax returns based on what their personal financial part is. We will then run their credit, set up a file, and have it ready to go, and that's usually good for about 120 days. We tell the client the maximum they qualify for, even though they may not want to extend themselves that much, and then we'll send them out examples of, based on what they want to buy, what those payments will be. We then hold off. We don't just issue a letter for the maximum amount. What we do is we then go back to the agent. We let them know that, okay, the buyer's qualified up to this amount, but when you write a purchase contract, we're going to send you a letter, and we don't care how many contracts you write or how many letters we need to provide, but we will do it instantly for you because it's set up in our system, and we will mirror the purchase contract. So that way we don't show the buyer's uh, total hand to the seller or listing agent when they are presenting that offer. But it's pretty much ready to go, and then it's a, a pr pr pretty much a bulletproof process at that point. So that's definitely a great idea because then the agents don't have to necessarily worry about uh, – really any paperwork snafus along the way. And the other thing you said, which I really like, is that you're working hand-in-hand -hand with the agents, you and your team are. Uh, so you don't want to just have, okay, well, Mr. Buyer, you found your house, you signed your contract, now let's go find you a loan officer. What it sounds like to me is you really do work with that agent and work with that buyer through the entire process, helping them maybe in some ways to even be more motivated and stay on track to buy a home. Whereas, you know, I think probably a lot of loan officers, they just essentially wait around for the signed contract and then get to work. You're getting to work the whole step, every step of the way, which I think a lot of agents, if they understand the difference, will really appreciate the extra effort you guys put in. Correct. We consider ourselves partners with the agent. Uh, the agent is our customer. The buyer is theirs and becomes ours through the process. But what also helps is, in some cases, we'll be notified by the buyer. They'll go, I need a pre-approval letter, and we want it made out to this other real estate agent. At that point, we become kind of alert, and we're very respectful of the fact that the agent who referred us that buyer is that as their customer, and at the risk of losing the buyer, we will notify the agent that your buyer is now attempting to work through another agent. Uh, we just find that it keeps our relationship strong and steady. We're not trying to hurt the new agent, but we're also, unless the, unless the buyer goes and tells the, the agent themselves, I'm not going to work with you, I'm going to work with another agent, but we don't see that as a common trend. And so our job is, again, we partner with real estate agents that want to work with us, and we become a team together and, and help move through this process. So I'm sure you identify and, and, and probably have a lot of the nation's top producing realtors, certainly in, in California. I know that's true because I, I know a lot of them personally that work with you. So what characteristics, qualities, what are these guys doing in this market that's so profoundly different than what the other realtors are doing that are making them top producers? And secondarily, are, those, are the agents that are your top producing agents now, are they different than the ones that were, say, four or five years ago in the bubble? Well, yes. First of all, this this um, this current market situation has, as we all know, weeded out uh, people who did not really understand, build their base, or work hard. There was many people, both on the lending side and the real estate side, that could pretty much put any kind of transaction together. There was a bit of a frenzy in the housing market going on, and so therefore, when everyone qualified because of the uh, stated income, 
and when everyone was trying to purchase a home just to make money quickly, um, everybody was in it. Everyone's brother, sister, aunt, and uncle were somehow involved in the transaction. Now what I've seen is a lot of the people who did not do their proper homework, uh, did not make a, a business and a career out of this industry on either side of the fence, I'll call it lending or real estate, though they were, they're pretty much removed from the industry. So now you're dealing with mostly professionals. To, to answer the other part is what do we see from the top ones, they embrace what is here. Uh, many people have said, I don't want anything to do with a short sale. I don't want anything to do with these things. And so what happens is, unfortunately, because it has become more of a mainstay in our in our business uh, uh, ventures, people have to realize it is it's the, hand, uh, the cards that are dealt to us, and we have to work with what is during this marketplace. And so rather than just kind of squeamishly apply towards it, they turn themselves into professionals, understand it, and focus on it, and say, I'm here to help people no matter what their situation is, and that gives them a broader range of uh, making business happen. So we've got a lot of questions, and, and uh, listeners, especially first-time listeners, remember, you guys can enter your questions into the webinar at any time. Um, and I see a lot of questions, a lot of great questions that are coming in specifically about different types of loans that are available. So if you can strap on your, your uh, top-producing lender hat, let's jump into some of these tougher questions. Okay. Um, is that okay? So sure. um, jumbo loan products. Okay, now in California, uh, it's I think the depending on where, the upper end jumbo limit's 729. Is that correct? For the well, what it's not just that. No, what happens is nationally, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is four hundred seventeen thousand. Based mm -hmm. on counties, it will be different. Mm -hmm. In Southern California's like Orange County, LA County, Riverside, and San Diego. In Orange and LA, it's 729, 750. It's 500 in Riverside, and it's 625 in San Diego. So throughout the country, it's broken down by county, not necessarily uh, state. And so that will do it. Now that is where they have higher loan limits of Fannie. We call it high balance conforming. That was due to expire December 31st, and they just extended it till September of 2011. So that will continue. But when you're asking for financing here, and let's just say uh, Orange County, it is, is above 729, 750. We call non-conforming or jumbo financing. Okay, so tell us about. I, I know for a long time, jumbo loans were a little bit, well, a lot harder to obtain. Has that loosened up at all? Yes, it has. It's still, it's still more regulated, guided, and tighter guidelines than that of Fannie and Freddie because they're basically in receivership of the federal government who is subsidizing it to try and still keep the housing market alive. When you deal above the, uh, when you turn into the jumbo section, you're just dealing with those banks who wish to uh, continue having that product available, who are committed to the real estate lending world, but also realize the risk is greatest in that area, so therefore the, the guidelines are tighter, such as uh, ratios for qualifying, uh, debt-to-income ratios, and reserve requirements as well, and down payment requirements. Well, let's give them some specifics. Obviously, you don't have – we can just make up the, you know, the, the typical sure. jumbo buyer. You, you probably have someone sitting on your desk, a file sitting on your desk right now that would probably – be worth uh, giving as an example. So um, we have a lot of agents, again, across the country, and uh, a lot of them deal in the most expensive markets in the country, and I know that the jump, securing jumbo mortgages and super jumbo mortgages has become a bit of a challenge, and I hope you guys heard what he said. It's simply for the fact that there's obviously fewer lenders in the game. So if someone wants to get a jumbo or a super jumbo mortgage, give us just a rough idea of the specifics of what's required. Well, up to, in our case, because Bank of America is one of the um, uh, largest lenders in the jumbo market, they'll go 80% financing to $2 million. That probably encompasses where we see the most of the jumbo financing. We've had an unequivocal amount of uh, buyers who pay cash above that amount. So we have very few apply for that. But up to it's about 20% down up to $2 million. They're looking at about a 41% debt-to-income ratio. If the loan exceeds one million, they or up to one million, they want 12 months reserves. And if they exceed uh, above one million, they're looking at 24 months reserves of principal, interest, taxes, and insurance on those loans. Okay, so reserves, guys, obviously he's talking about whatever the monthly payment would be. The banks want to see, the lenders want to see, the investors want to see that the owner's got 
you know, in one case, a 12-month supply of savings that covers that payment, and in the other case, a 24-month supply. Um, so that's definitely different than it was just a few years ago. <laughs> Correct. Uh, usually it was two months. <laughs> so. uh, two, two months, and could you fog a mirror? All right. So Correct. Let, now let's talk about the other end of things. The other question we get a lot is investor loans. What's really happening in that end of the market? You're, you're in the Fannie Freddie market, that is uh, pretty much – the uh, you know you can still put 20% down however the guidelines are tighter once the buyer has 25% down it becomes a little more lenient uh and 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 you can, you can and you also get better interest rates however in the jumbo market most because in in when a housing downturn happens and a and a homeowner has multiple properties their primary residence a second home and an investment property if they can only afford to keep one property, it's usually they keep their primary and they let go of their second home or their investment property. So the investment properties are considered a greater risk to a lender than that of a primary residence. So what happens is the down payments are greater. Now, when you get in a jumbo market now, they want as much as 50% down, and in many times they just cap out and say, you know, the max, most don't do it, or they or they don't even go to the higher loan limits now. We're pretty much capped out at around a million, and that's about as high as the loans will go, and most don't even offer that. Um, the types of mortgage that are, uh, mortgages that, that folks are getting. So, um, and Julie's got some questions about special loan programs too, but the types of loans. So are we seeing, I, I assume, a lot more 30-year fixed? Are people still doing, you know, arms? What, what, what type of programs are there out there right now? Well, all the programs are available, uh, the five-year and seven-year when people are doing arms, but that is an extreme minority of the loans, probably no more than 2% of all loans being made. Wow. Almost everything is 30% financing right now, and because rates have been so low, we have seen a, a large increase in the 15-year and the 20-year loans, as mostly on the fi refinancing side. Kevin, because, Kevin, let me jump in here. I, I wasn't please. sure if I heard. Did you say 30%? You said 30% financing. I assume you mean 30% down is the typical down. No, 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 no. No, no, I was saying 30-year fixed rate loans. Oh, 30-year fixed rate. Sorry. Is what okay. The, is what the what the right. the predominant loan of choice is, which is the sure. intelligent thing. Number one, um, I even saw recently in a, in a in an article of the loans, uh, which type of loans are defaulting the most, and obviously the arms are because that's where people now their the interest only options go away and they become uh, the the loans adjust and they also become amortizing, so it's a payment shock to the client. We also know we are at historical low lows now on the interest rates. So to lock in for as long as you can. If somebody really said, I'm being transferred here, I'm out of here in two years, then maybe getting a five-year arm is, is acceptable if, you can, if the rate is low enough and, and helps the buyer with the payment. But otherwise, locking in today because life changes and those people who took those short-term arms now regret it, and knowing that you can lock up rates in the threes and four percents is, is inc incredible right now, and you want to tie that up forever if you can. Well, absolutely. And if inflation kicks in like some people or, you know, or maybe it already has, it's really kind of a debatable topic, but Correct. if it really kicks in, then your house essentially becomes free because it'll be, you know, quote unquote, uh, inflating at uh, a greater rate or the same rate as whatever your interest rate is. So it really, Correct. but rates just last week, they went up a little bit, didn't they? Yes, they did. In anticipation, there was a few things that affected that. One was the, the uh, Fed's buying of additional. They had stopped in March after purchasing trillions of dollars worth of uh, mortgages and U.S. debt known as treasuries. And so what's happened is they restarted it here recently in November. So what happened was there's a, there was that mindset that this is going to be inflationary to us, and so people were upset, and a lot of the large bond traders in the world like uh, PIMCO for one, they have decided to try and sell while there's a huge buyer of these. Because if you try and sell something, obviously when there's no buyers, the price is worse for you. So now that the U.S. government stepped up and is buying. So what they did with all the large selling, we actually saw an increase of about 50 basis points or a half a percent in rates that moved up for, during this period. I suspect it will not stay this way for very long because they'll stop their selling at some point here. A lot of this has to do with 
the large largest money managers of the world selling off, and they usually do this in their portfolios, and they'll be done by year end. But the Treasury or the U.S. government will still be buying, so we'll have a reprieve probably uh, around the first of the year, and the rates will go back down again. So let's talk about special programs. And what would be the programs that? Well, I know when Julie and I sold real estate, we always kept in really good contact. Uh, with our top loan officer friends because they were the ones that were telling us about, hey, Tim and Julie, did you guys know about this program or that program? And having that knowledge about these specialized programs gave us uh, an advantage in the marketplace because we could actually obviously sell more houses because we could we knew that more buyers qualified than, say, just your typical loan officer that might not be that acutely aware of the various programs that are out there. So, Julie, what questions did you have specifically pertaining to that? Well, Kevin, I, you send these great emails out, and then occasionally I'll see some kind of cool program that you're talking about. The one that always comes to my mind is um, maybe a month or two ago you sent one out having to do with doctors. Yes. And I think it was 5% down up to 850. I might be remembering incorrectly. That is but, correct. Okay. So, you know, talk about some of these special programs that, you know, back in the boom, nobody, I don't know if they even had those types of programs because maybe you didn't really need to. But to Tim's point, what we found is the more lending programs you know about as a real estate professional, the more likely you are to do multiple types of deals, which means, of course, higher volume, more deals. You're absolutely correct, and that is the whole point of what we try and do is bring these programs out on a regular basis, and I'll discuss some of them. But the idea is if you hear one program, people go, oh, well, I don't really you know, see that as setting the world on fire or doing it, but by knowing four or five different programs, being aware of them when you're talking, when an agent is talking to their clients and all of a sudden it will, it will trigger and go, you know what, there is something for that or there's something for this. There's the Now the doctor loan was around, uh, it went to uh, zero down to a million and now it's 5% wow. down to 850. So you see, huh. because those are a portfolio product of the bank and therefore that is something where they're, it's more cautious as we discussed. But there's loans for doctors. In California, you have loans called uh, CalSTRS and CalPERS. So those are those are you know you have loans for teachers, doctors, uh, public employees of government agencies. Um, you know those are different ones. So we're always trying to advertise. Usually, what they are is low down uh, programs because most buyers they may have the income, they don't have the the resources for the down payment. And so that's that's always been part of the thing. Well, with rates really low right now, still looking for first-time home buyers. Yes, the federal subsidy is gone, but that doesn't mean that someone in an apartment doesn't wish to buy. And so that's another thing is where where you're we're always trying to find a way. They go, well, I don't have a lot, or a lot of these will allow for gifts of the entire down or most of the down, and the down may only be three and a half percent or three percent. So. We're, we're always trying to help find ways to get people in the homes the least expensive way. Well, in the past, if you were in a high interest rate cycle, a small down, they'd still go, but I can't afford the payment. But with rates so low, they're finding if they can scrape up that down somewhere, that minimum amount of money, then that, then we're then they're able to to uh, afford the payment because the rates are low, and we can show them where renting versus buying is now in a, in a fantastic mode where by you know taking a, le- uh, a few more deductions on your W-4 form allows you to net more. Therefore, that's what takes care of making that future payment and having the tax write-off, which is still in force and by the federal government, the people are able to offset that difference. But I'll think of, but let, me, let me jump in there, Kevin, because you please. said like three or four things I think it's really important that our agents pull out. So um, first of all, let's go in the reverse order. The, how big of a deal, really, do you find that the tax deduction is to your uh, loan clients? How, I it's, mean, how much of a decider is that that they can save a little bit of money on their taxes? To the first-time home buyer, it's 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 huge. To the experienced home buyer or the multiple home buyer, I don't know that they even phase that in a little bit. To the wealthy, they already know they're capped out at a million as it is, so they don't. Uh, it, at that point, I don't see that that's even a. Uh, they, it, the, the topic doesn't come up. Sometimes we'll go, you know what? I'm just going to put down to a million because my CPA said that's all I can afford. You know, I I, I just need the write-off, and there, I don't see any. Re- otherwise, I wouldn't even have have a mortgage. But to the first-time home buyer, like I said, where you can show them on paper by claiming more deductions, netting more in their paycheck every month, they're going to make and move that rent payment up from 
uh, 2000 to 2600 and now they can take on that mortgage payment and buy a condo, which is now affordable, very affordable, and doing that. But they couldn't do that if they didn't have the mortgage deduction. So are you saying that, the, well, if they, obviously a lot of, this is something we've been reporting on for the better part of a year, that every once in a while the whole conversation seems to erupt in D.C. about getting rid of the home buyer tax deduction, or the the homeowner's tax deduction, sorry. Um, and there's a lot of mixed opinions on whether or not that would make much of a difference. They're talking about how much additional revenue that would bring in in the form of taxes and the rest of it. Do you have an opinion? If they were to actually get rid of the, the home the homeowner's tax deduction, would that make a huge difference, little difference or no difference on the real estate industry in all likelihood based on your own experience? I would think it would have, especially in the very beginning, would have such a negative impact uh, with the outcry and outlash that a lot of people would sit on their hands and probably stop for a period of time. Ultimately, people want home ownership, and when they see properties back to appreciating in a more stable market and they are now solid in their employment and they feel like they may be actually be getting raises, more people will then actually want to start buying again and doing it and maybe they'll be somewhat limited on what they do because of it, but I do feel it plays a large factor. I so don't psych it's psychological effects, really, and, and you're saying, of course, in this market, when the real estate uh, market is struggling to come back, kind of a bad time to be talking about eliminating that tax deduction. <laughs> Correct. Well, the most <laughs> last proposal that I saw you know, that they were going to do is loans not over 500000 or that would, they were going to try and bring the cap down, but... With the talk currently of extending everything for at least two more years, I think that will probably put this whole topic on hold here shortly. Right, exactly. Well, let's hope. Okay, so yeah. um, now that we have obviously a lot of students that focus on short sales. And the short, whole short sale, uh, buying a home after a short sale, how long you have to wait. I hope you have your FHA regulations dusted off because I've got about 19 questions about the subject. I'm going to kind of probably summarize it in the form of two or three questions. But Let's talk about uh, specifically how does how long does someone have to wait at your bank, at Bank of America, after they do a short sale? How does that work? I know there's a lot of moving parts to this question. You can handle it in any way you please. <laughs> okay. Well, number one is because the majority of the loans really don't fall under uh, Fannie Freddie guidelines. It's not what Bank of America sets individually. It's the investors that the loans are sold to is where the uh, – prominence of the guidelines are, are met. And what that is is on conventional with 20% down, it's a two-year wait currently after a the closing of a short sale. And on but let, me, let me repeat that, Kevin. I'm really sorry to interrupt you. That's right. But it's important, I think, that we underline this because I'm thinking now as a realtor co-chair, as the nation's Oh, I hate saying this because I'm modest, but the nation's number one real estate coaching organization, it's important the realtors hear what you just said. Two years, guys, after the short sale has transacted, with 20% down, your borrowers will qualify again to obtain financing. So be clear on that. Now, how many of you out there right now, considering we've been in this real estate market where short sales and the rest of it really came into prevalence in late 06, I think mostly in the fall of 07, so we're going into 2011 now. Some of you are going to be listening to this interview in 2012 and 2014. How many people closed on short sales, got rid of their you know underwater homes through hardship or whatever else a couple years ago, three years ago, four years ago, lots. How many of those guys would like to get back in the housing market? Think about this, guys. Look at the opportunity that's there. For the ambitious realtor out there, you better be thinking about the fact that, well, you should call your old short sale closings. You should be calling maybe some of the realtors that are no longer – in the business, and their files are sitting there, and those, buy and those are prospective buyers for you. Think out of the box here a little bit, guys. This information, information like what Kevin's passing along to you, don't assume you know it, because I've learned three or four things in this call so far that I didn't know, and he's clarified for me. So, all right, Kevin, now I assume in that two years that people obviously have to have kept their credit clean, and they still have to qualify based on ratios and all the basic stuff, correct? Correct. Absolutely. You know, there's, but they, it's still going to always be analyzed as far as, you know, was it a one-time event? Was it mm -hmm. something, that, a special circumstance, or is it just a continuance of just bad credit? Um, and so from that standpoint. So your credit's not, it's not like a bankruptcy where your credit is all wiped out and then you have to restart it again. Usually it's just, 
if if it was just your house that you end up quit making the payments on or you lost and it's reported as such then you you still will have maybe credit card or your car payment and other things but they can look and tell whether it was during a window period and if people were able to right size themselves and get kind of back on track again and and that is acceptable and i do want to throw in fha by the way is 3 years still but fannie and freddie does allow for 2 years Um, And I just recently saw something that I found very unique. I was flabbergasted, but I actually watched it. It happened through another lender, not through us. And somebody had a short sale. They turned around, and the next uh, month they turned around, bought a home, and got financing. And And yet it was reported on their credit report. So I thought, first, the lender made a mistake. In fact, what happened was it turned out the reason they sold was because their child had an illness and there was something in the environment where they were living that was creating this problem. They had to sell for their child's health, had medical and doctor um, uh, documentation to substantiate this, and they were actually, because it was such a uh, forced situation for them, the lender went ahead and granted that as an exception and did it. So I think you'll see those type of things True hardship. prevail. Yeah, true hardships. True will, hardships. Now, right. they don't want, they're not letting up on it now because if they know that if they said do a short sale, do a foreclosure, and turn around and buy again, it will probably increase the amount of people who might actually step up and, and just sell their home and put the lenders and the economy. Well, what's, 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 being, what's being publicized, to your point, Kevin, what's being publicized, you know, what people know about and what's really happening are two very different things. I mean, there's, you know, I talk. <laughs> I was talking about this actually on a different webinar yesterday, and I had two people that got really angry at me when I stated this fact. And this is just some sort of little secret test program that was happening on behalf of Fannie Mae where they were doing mortgage reinstatement. So literally somebody would lose the house in a foreclosure. They were packing their boxes, and there would be a knock on the door. You know, After the foreclosures happened, the first has been wiped out, the home back homeowners dues, the whole nine yards, and then they were being offered uh, an, uh, an opportunity to reinstate the mortgage at the prevailing rates at the foreclosed upon them out. Now, a lot of people know about that program. It's being tested um, around the country as we speak, but there's lots of little programs that are popping up like that when – you know, it's it's some people take this sort of moral high road to have blah blah blah. But you know, at the end of the day, guys, more people in homes at this point, uh, fewer vacant homes at this point. That's really what we need. And we can take the moral high grind after we're all out of uh, under, you know, basically on dry shore again and not wading up to our necks in water. So I mean, I, it's interesting the different programs that are out there. So I mean, with regards to short sales, I have you had anyone? Um, that you've had go through the loan process again where uh, it's been two years, they kept their credit clean and the rest of it, and the lender has turned them down? No, not as of yet. We've just started now to originate loans for those short sales, as you've pointed out. It is becoming. But what we do is because we look at it up front and, and I'm in an underwriting center, we meet with our underwriters, we review it, we get that approval pretty much up front, so then they can go ahead and buy. And because everyone is very cautious and scared and wondering whether it'll really happen or not, so once we enter them into the system, they're not then turned down. So we we pretty much do those pre-approvals up front, which eliminates that. And I haven't had one just based on the fact that they'd had a previous short sale decline for that reason. If it meets guidelines, then the loan is approved. So they're not going back and they're not saying, well, well, maybe it's too soon to be asking this question. Maybe when I interview you next year at the same time, you'll have more <laughs> of a, there'll be more people that have come back in the market. But I'm just sort of curious as to whether or not the strategic defaulters are going to be somehow put in the penalty box for a longer period of time. And I suspect they will not be. Well, it will be, it will be difficult uh, to determine what caused it in many cases. Right. So I think that would that would be tough. And obviously because which you mentioned the twenty percent down, well some individuals who, you know, obviously have many individuals, they've lost their home, they don't have the additional money for the down, and that's what's also preventing them from moving forward. So that's why we haven't seen as many opportunities. Right. So um some questions that are coming in about appraisals. Appraisals uh make it into the news, especially the real estate headlines quite often now because a lot of appraisal issues are happening and killing deals. Um I, that's a lot of questions about appraisal issues. How is uh, Bank of America, how is your staff dealing with appraisals that don't sync up with contract prices? Well, okay. Now with the government regulations, um 
the, the loan origination side of the business may no longer have any contact with the appraisal side of the industry. So we were quite concerned about that. Uh, many times we'd even ask the appraisers up front information and, and do it, but the government now it put, has put a firewall there and, and it's strictly enforced. So then when this whole changed, it happened that we were getting appraisers from different locations far away and they didn't know their local community or these developments and so that in itself was causing us a major grief. But now, see what happens is like with Bank of America, they have what they call LandSafe. That's their appraisal management company and it manages the appraisers and, they, and as we've gotten through all this initiative, and the government usually says, okay, here you go, and then we have to go and figure it out and make sure we're in <laughs> compliance. So it, there's why it takes a little bit of time. We don't often have all this, um, you know, foresight and trying to work everything out. And so now they pretty much have it. I don't, I haven't seen, sometimes we, we, we get some things or it may be more of a property issue, you know, if it's a foreclosure and they've torn things out. But as far as values themselves, I think it's, we've real, that's all settled down and we're not finding a lot of uh, deal breakings going on at this point. It was happening a lot last year. It's kind of leveled off, I agree. So, Linda, in Orange, uh, Orange, California, maybe you should be contacting Kevin and making him your uh, loan officer of choice. Uh, Joanne from Las Vegas asked for Kevin's contact information. So, Kevin, we had a lot of people dial in late here. What is your best contact information? Well, my cell number is area code 949-422-2074. And I'm sure if you were to uh, Google me or put in uh, KevinBuddy.com, you'll you'll find me very very easily. Like I said, I've I've been in the business here for uh, 35 years, and and I'm I I find myself I can't believe how many blogs and people use my information and put it. I find myself all over the place, and I'm even shocked sometimes. Well, it's Buddy too. It's B U D D E, right? So that I is mean, they, correct. That, so correct. it's KevinBuddy.com. All right. So Ellen um, from Washington D.C. asked, there are uh, still creditworthy borrowers with good assets who do not meet standard criteria. Are these buyers totally out of luck? It depends on what standard criteria is, because if someone like what we run into often is. Someone that hasn't been in the country that long, or they're very young and don't have a lot. Either one of these cases, they don't have a lot of established credit. We are finding that it's mainstay now. It's it's easing, eased, eased up a little bit where we're doing what we call non-traditional credit, where we can get cell phone bills, utility bills, other things, uh, rental surveys, uh, for, where they where they've paid rent for a period of time, cancel checks. So we establish it that way from that standpoint. But if they really exceed the ratios, the government had tightened one more time. We were doing on Fannie Freddie about a 50% debt to income ratio. Now they're pretty much holding us to about 45. So I guess it comes to reason if someone's at a 60% debt to income, debt to income ratio, would we say, well, gee, we're, we're not being easy on them. But then I sat back and said, if someone's at a 60% debt to income ratio, should they really be buying? Are we just setting up tomorrow's foreclosure? So that's what I always question. But I, I don't, uh, we, they work with people, you know, we still co-mortgage, we still find ways, they just reverted back to the way that the industry was before this whole melee in the housing market took off. Really in the 90s, basically, we've gone back to the same lending standards that, that the country used when Julie and I were doing uh, selling real estate. So as far as like, you have a lot of obviously people and self-employed types, people like that. When you have somebody that doesn't necessarily report all their income, I mean, to Ellen's question and several others, I'm scanning through the questions now, are they out of luck? I mean, if you can't really substantiate all your income through good old-fashioned W-2s, uh, at this point, what, are your, what is your alternative? Is it just well, a larger that is, yeah. that is the part. That is the area that's been most hurt. In 1986, they came out with what they termed in those days liar loans. And it was basically for self-employed people because I remember back in the 70s and early 80s that most self-employed business owners carried two sets of books, one for the lender and one for the IRS. And so that was widely known, and they wanted to stop that, and so people wouldn't be doing those sort of things. So they came up with, if you're self-employed, you have great credit. You know, we understand that on paper you look terrible, but here you own this beautiful home. You're making these car payments. You're doing this. Obviously, you're generating income. 
so they worked with you. But then what happened is in the, in the housing market as it took off, people that were working at uh, fast food restaurants, uh, flipping burgers, were all of a sudden on high salaries, and people abused the program, and so therefore it's lost. There isn't anything now, and the double whammy is, is they put in a rule that says if you have declining income, we won't average it, or you may not, you may be turned down. Well, in this economy, a lot of times people's income this last year or the okay. Year what before, is that? What does that mean? I, that's actually a new one to me. If you had, so it's a new call. I don't know about that one. Declining income. Correct. They, tell tell me about that. Well, let's let's say that um, your your 2008 income is higher in your business, uh, and is much higher than than your 2009 income. Mm-hmm. Then what happens is if they're concerned, if it's fallen off 25% or more, then they're concerned that trend may continue oh. and, and on its way down, and therefore you may not be you may be denied a loan based on that information alone. So basically they'll assume that if you're making less this year than you did last year, they might assume that that momentum is going to continue in the negative direction, and that right there might take you out of the, the mortgage borrowing market. Interesting. Correct, and that's that's primarily fine with business owners. Uh, not usually people who are uh, a teacher, a fireman, a policeman, that sort of thing. They're usually keeping the same. However, we're finally seeing that some people are breathing a little easier and are seeing things a little bit better in '09, and so they want to use that to buy. But we're not, right now telling them, unfortunately, they're, okay. The, the rule is if you tell it to the IRS, it must be true. So that's we've reverted back to that again. And the other part is I call it prove it. So if you say these things are true, you must prove it. And so what happens is we need filed 2010 tax returns at this point. So someone says, I'm having a great 2009, I'm getting a bonus at the end of the year, or I'm pulling money out, I'm gonna, I want to buy a house now, and, and I can use my, my bonus. We go, unfortunately, we can't document your income until you have filed your 2010 oh, tax return. Oh, interesting. So, so pay stubs and the rest don't hold the same Not credence. if it's a business owner. It does, though, obviously, if you are an employee working for, you know, if you're working for Motorola and you're a sales executive and you're doing it, then then yes, because you well, have what, a what about? I'm I'm sorry to jump on what That's you were right. saying. What about, what about if you are a business owner? Because I'm now thinking of some of our realtor clients. And Correct. let's say, for example, you work for a corporation. The the commission checks or the paychecks or the income flows to the corporation. You're an employee of the corporation, and you are a shareholder of the corporation. Would that would that kind of skirt that, or would that not no, work? No, because what happens is they look at they'll know that agents uh, and corporations have write offs. And we and they we don't know that those write offs may have doubled in the amount to get this increased income. So that's mm-hmm. why they have to see the filed return. And what used to be only business owners signed a forty five oh six, which is a document that lenders used to fax to the IRS to validate the income uh, that was uh, told to the lender. All borrowers are now having to do that. So uh, they they definitely want – that's the one area where they definitely want to see the information. If the IRS has it, accepts it, and shows it as filed, then we will then accept it. So the 4506 now is required. It was just a couple of years ago something that it didn't get signed in the closing docs. No one really cared. Now it's required. Now they're doing it prior to drawing the loan documents. Oh, my gosh. Well, nice. Correct. And are they actually pulling the returns prior to pulling no, the loan No, what doc- they do is the IRS faxes it back within a 24 to 48-hour period stating what the income was that was reported. We say, here's oh, wow. what we were shown versus here, and then they validate whether that's it. So if someone says they, they're showing a much higher number and the IRS shows much lower, then we obviously have a problem. Interesting. Well, so I hope – I mean, that again, I didn't know that. That is really – but you know what? I, it's interesting how different it is because I just I remember I remember so many of these people that were just like you said they were buying properties that you just had to scratch your head. So you know you make sixty thousand dollars a year and you just bought a six hundred thousand dollar house. How exactly does that work? But now really what it sounds like is that people are actually really honest to God have to prove their income. You, it, there's, so there's two sides to that coin. One, you kind of think, well, like where you live, Kevin, in Orange County, where the average income, I think actually I read in the Orange County Register the average income in Orange County was like $68,000, where there's a heck of a lot of properties out there that your average buyer is not going to be able to qualify for. makes one wonder what's going to happen to property values, doesn't it? Well, it's come, the affordability index is what you're referring to mm-hmm. is much, much more in line uh, than, it, than it was. If you look at that number of 
three, four years ago, it was just, you wondered how anyone could buy a home, and if it wasn't for stated income, there'd probably be about half the homes out there never would have actually been sold. Which maybe in retrospect wouldn't have been a bad thing. Correct. <laughs> now I, I want to I want to add something obviously for your agents because so many of the uh, uh, agents we work with and have worked with that have uh, been burned by transactions where the deals fall out I hear this from agents the agents that I don't know or they'll, they'll complain and go you know I'm just so tired of these deals falling out what they do more and more and more is they write us in the MLS saying must be must be pre qualified by the Kevin Buddy team so you pick your lender of choice. What happens is people put up a stink. They don't like that. They think it's intrusive. But I cannot tell you, stress enough, how many times we look at someone else's stuff and go, I don't know what this other lender in his pre-qualification letter was doing because this buyer does not qualify. We prevent that from happening. So whether it's my team, whether it's anyone you work with, have someone you know validate that transaction, and if people aren't willing to do that, then you know what? Then then you're putting yourself, uh, you're setting yourself up for a problem, and that's how you can prevent and close a high, high percentage of all your transactions is having someone credible validate what what you're being told. And and I did stay. I was talking in front of a large group of realtors. I got to tell you this, and I said, you know what? Less than one percent of all the realtors ever call me on these letters and say, "Is this thing good?" And then one realtor stood up and said, "That's because it's you, Kevin. We don't need to call." And I go, oh, "Okay, nice. well, I appreciated that, but the fact is, is that you need to call the lender and and ask important questions when you get those pre-approval letters when you're accepting these offers and smell out anything." Well, so and let me reinforce what you're saying and maybe take it in a slightly different direction. Uh, a lot of our students are some of the top listing agents for REO companies and asset management companies, and, you know, in Bank of America for that matter, Correct. across the country. We have some of the top Bank of America REO listing agents as coaching students. And you guys know that if you have a, you know, a higher ratio of failed submitted contracts, in other words, you submit a buyer contract on an REO property, Bank of America or whoever your asset management company approves it, and then the contract doesn't work out because that buyer's financing, in other words, things that are, quote, unquote, hypothetically out of your control, that works against you. You have that happen too many times. Your score drops, and then surprise, surprise, no more REO assets are showing up in your email. So what Kevin is saying is something that Julie and I did as well. Uh, Julie, why don't you talk about that? Because I remember when you and I learned the hard way to do that. Well, I think there's a lot of different levels to this. One is we The addendum seen... that we used to write. That's oh. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So this is a new thought for a lot of agents, as you know, Kevin, that you know, there's a whole batch of agents that kind of cut their teeth in the boom. And this stuff that we're talking about right now seems complicated and weird and maybe even overkill to a lot of them. You know, so what we did back, you know, when we were following the rules that everybody has to follow now is we had what we called our everything addendum. We would get one of these sort of boilerplate lender letters in that who knows the lender, maybe we never heard of them before. It looks very standard, but we would counter offer every deal, regardless of who the agent was or who the lender was, saying specifically um, that we require that the credit has actually been checked. The ratios are actually well, adequate to, for the purchase of this loan. And they had to be qualified. And Julie, they, we even got to the point in our addendum. They so, went through our lender. Right, our lender. We get Right, we, and, and yeah, Kevin's right, and especially some of these agents, and you know, Julie and I call it as it is, some of these guys with egos, they said like, oh, my loan officer, this, that, and the other, but what that, that agent doesn't realize is they don't know whether their loan office, that loan officer's actually done a thorough sort of pre-qual. Yeah, well, we got tired of hearing, you know, oh, well, the underwriter came back and said, now that we've exactly. checked all three credit bureaus, well, now we have problems. Right, I mean, so that's what happened is that, you know, we had... When Julie and I were first getting started, Kevin, now this was back in the early 90s, but we had some deals flake out after we'd gotten these really nice-looking lenders' letters, and we found out, well, it's because the lender who had you know, done the prequal was on the golf course at the time that he was talking to the other agent's buyer. and Burned you know, out of course, he did, plate letter. Yeah, exactly, and you know, texted his uh, – or emailed at the time his – you know, assistant, and they just turned out some sort of letter that was on his hard drive. And, and guys, what you need to do is you need to understand that it, if that happens in the REO world, that works against you. If that happens in uh, really in, in the short sale world, that can work against you too because how would you like to go and get the short sale processed and all of a sudden you find out at the 11th hour that the buyer doesn't really qualify. So write into every one of your contracts, and if you decide to make Kevin Buddy your primary lender wherever you are in the country, those of you especially in California – Literally write into the contract, or as Kevin said in the MLS, that all buyers have to be pre-approved. Now, 
you might get some resistance. You probably will from the co-ops, but you're doing them a huge favor because they but might not. They might not know they're working with an unqualified buyer. They might, they may have talked with a they may be working with a let's be honest unqualified loan officer that qualified that unqualified buyer. So I know guys, this sounds like a lot of extra steps, but at the end of the day, it really does take you to the next level and makes you more professional. Well, and I, what I would say is, you do more transactions. Yeah, if your lender you're working with right now doesn't sound like Kevin sounds, you probably <laughs> need to either work with Kevin or shop for someone who sounds like Kevin. I mean, I, I can't be more clear about that. Because, you know, some of the, the deals that agents complain about dying, some of that could have been prevented by getting in front of some of these lending questions before it was the 11th hour. Right. I mean, Kevin's going to say, well, is this guy a – no, it turns out that the wife's a teacher, so there is a special program that maybe we but didn't – You need to you change know. the type of deal sometimes. Right. And so, that, you know. guys, that's really the bottom line. That's the reason we like to expose you to folks like Kevin – because you don't assume. How do you agents out there? How do you feel when everyone assumes that all realtors are the same? Even though you have your designations, even though you've been enrolled to Harris Real Estate University for years, even though you've done you know hundreds of real estate transactions, and they're thinking you're the same as the guy next to you who just got their real estate license and the ink is even and dry on their real estate license. I mean, so there's a huge difference in the loan officer world, just as there is obviously in the realtor world. So. Hopefully, we haven't overwhelmed you with new information. Hopefully, we've given you a little bit more education and motivation. So, Kevin, I'm going to let you wrap the call up. I asked this question earlier, and I think it's probably worth mentioning again, especially after this call, the agents that are really doing really well in this marketplace, the agents that you can just think, like I'm thinking of Nick Rashi and Vince Bindi. I'm thinking of some of the other um, agents that you and I share as clients. What is it that they're doing? What is it, if, if you had to sort of like break it down to maybe two or three real points that, that makes these guys so spectacular, guys and gals, obviously, what, what would those two or three points be in your, in your opinion? Well, you know, how I, how I look at it is what I see is, you know, real estate business is now a, a true profession, and it's a lot of work. And each agent is able to succeed based on their personality and work ethics, but you can't do it all. You can't be a one-man show. So you need to develop a team. And I even use, like, from my standpoint or what you, what an agent could look at is as a doctor. When you go to a doctor's office, someone else hands you the clipboard. Someone else takes your temperature. Someone else weighs you in. Eventually you're put in a room. Then you see the doctor. That's a specialist. You need people to support you. You need to have a team. You need to have assistance to free you up. If you're in your office all day long making uh, flyers of your new listing and doing that sort of thing instead of prospecting, and working and focusing on face-to-face uh, -face with clients, talking to people, helping them. That's really what you're using your knowledge and your profession and, 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 and committing to your business and having people assist you in some fashion. That will free you up to do that. But if you try and be a one-man band, you're, you're only going to hit a certain level and you're going to keep bumping against that ceiling and won't be able to break loose. That's right. So delegate, really, is what I'm hearing you say. Delegate, Correct. realize that a great loan officer like Kevin and his staff, they really become a natural extension of your team. When Julie and I were selling real estate, that's certainly how we thought of our loan officers, is we saw them as a natural extension. They were going to go and ask a lot of the same prequal questions that we were, but strangely enough, they sometimes got different answers that either told us that this was a great potential client or, frankly, it wasn't, because maybe the loan officer is asking more specific, targeted financial questions, and they expose some skeletons in some closets, those types of things. So agents, to Kevin's point, this really is a market about professional standards, knowing how to actually get deals closed. This isn't something you can just lightly get into anymore. And that's the reason that we're seeing so many of you that are starting to become, frankly, top producers, maybe selling more houses than a lot of you would have ever dreamed of in the bubble. Certainly, I think it's interesting to me to watch how there's been a of course, you know, I, I say this at the same time knowing I'm going to take some flack for it, but in a lot of markets, the agents that were the top producers during the bubble, the guys that were getting all the recognition, well, you know, what happened to them? They're no longer in that position. It's totally shifted. And now it's kind of almost the agent that's a little bit of a propeller head, the agent that's got a little bit of the extra knowledge on how to do short sales and BPOs and maybe do some social networking. Some of the things that require more than just a strong salesman-type personality, those are the agents that are starting to take hold in the market 
marketplace and really starting to command the greatest market share. So, guys, embrace it. Don't fight it. Accept the fact that this isn't just a, you know, as Kevin made the excellent point of, this isn't just some sort of one- or two-year aberration. This is something that's going to signify a new housing market. This is going to be what the housing market is like realistically for the next, you know, some people say 2020, 2025. So, effectively, for the majority of your real estate careers, this is the market. Don't fight it. Embrace it and understand that it's a lot easier when you've got people like Kevin helping you tow the wagon. So, Kevin, listen, on behalf of Julie and myself, I really wanted to thank you for joining us today. I, uh, Can I, I, I want to throw one more thing in there just to finish sure. up? I know you're wrapping it. But I, I say the most constant thing about the, our industry is change. So if you're not changing, you're getting left behind. And that's the most. That's what you just said. Is every year keep reinventing yourself. What's new? What's doing it? If you keep saying, "But I've always done it this way," then you will. You're destined to fail. Your real estate roadkill, basically. Correct. So you know what? One last, um, <laughs> one last shout out there. How do people get hold of you? How do, how would someone send you a loan? I heard Kevin Buddy B U D D I. I'm sorry, B U D D E dot com. How else can they get a hold well, of you? Let me give you my email because that's probably always the easiest and the and the quickest. Uh, so if people are long distance, it's it's my name with a dot in the middle at bankofamerica.com. dot com. So let me say that it's Kevin K E V I N dot Buddy B U D D E at and then you just spell out Bank of America dot com. And you guys don't have to worry about Kevin getting inundated with calls and emails and the rest of it. He has a very very capable staff. Uh, Julie mentioned earlier, just for all of you who don't have a loan ready to send over to Kevin, um, he does have a really great emailed newsletter. How does someone get on that? Uh, you know, I know we use sometimes we use your content from the emails for some of our classes. They would well, just what, they would just request it of me. Just send me an email saying put me on your list, and I'll I'll give them that. I only send it out. It's not I try and send it out once a week, but if I don't have anything valuable, I don't put it out. It's just primarily whatever, like I was talking about buy-downs uh, two weeks ago, and, and we did those popular in the 80s, and I'm trying to show don't lower the sales price, but how to pay for a buy-down and lower the rate for the buyer. And there's so many w methods and tools. Again, one isn't a catch-all, but knowing many ways will ultimately help you keep deals together or make deals happen. Absolutely. So, Kevin, on behalf of Julie, myself, and all the faculty and staff and all of our thousands of students here at Harris Real State University, I want to sincerely thank you for joining us for today's Superstar interview. And everyone who's listening, if you have any questions about loans, lenders, if you have any tough deals, if you have any transactions that you're just not sure about how to get the borrower qualified, you are now having a direct relationship and contact with not just you know, he's the number one loan officer for the number one lender, I mean, arguably, in the world. I mean, who's bigger than Bank of America? And Kevin Buddy is the number one loan officer for Bank of America for the entire nation. So because of Harris Real Estate University and because you are staying tuned in, you now have direct contact with him. Reach out to him, regardless of what state you're in, and maybe make this guy your preferred loan officer. I know if Julie and I were still selling real estate, we certainly would. So on behalf of Julie, myself, and all the faculty and staff of Harris Real Estate University, I want to thank you for joining us for today's Superstar Interview. Thank you, thank Kevin. Thank you very much. All righty. Bye-bye.